Thank you for the opportunity to share with you our work in the Micronesian Outer Islands, incorporating multiple knowledge systems into ocean management solutions, linking traditional practice, Western science and novel technologies in the Micronesian Outer Islands. I wanna thank my colleagues, John Magul Rumal, Michelle Paddock, Giacomo Bernardi, and so many other people who are involved in this work and who make it happen. I wanna give a special thanks to the people of the Outer Islands and the Yap Outer Islands in particular, who've shared this story and their story with the world and made this work possible. Working together on the complex solutions of today and trying to conserve and manage reefs and reef ecosystems requires multiple knowledge systems. These problems are complex and the roots of the problems are complex. We need multiple approaches to this. There's working with policymakers and governments, there's working with um, scientists and people, our story today is about working with communities themselves, working closely with communities to understand these problems and find solutions to them. I'm going to take you to Yap. Yap is a state, one of four states in the Federated States of Micronesia, south of Japan, east of the Philippines, north of Australia and Indonesia. It's an area of vast ocean. It was also the area, um, Ulithia Atoll, in fact, was the area where James Cameron down here on the lower right staged his Challenger Deep Expedition because Ulithia Atoll is the closest landmass to the Marianas Trench. The, the water is extremely deep out here. The Yap Outer Islands extend some 1300 kilometers eastward into the West Pacific. Um, here on the right, um, sorry, in the upper left, you can see Ulithia Atoll. Uh, well, we'll be talking a lot about this in the next few minutes. Um, Yap Main Island here, and then we'll be taking some some uh, trips out here to Satawal and Ilato and all the way out to the east of the Yap state. And we took a couple of expeditions and we'll be talking about data from there as well. It's a place where traditional sailing canoes are still used for much of the marine resource extraction. Um, it's also had its Western footprint. There's a supply ship that visits these islands. And of course, the Yap outer islands and Satawal in particular are the birthplace of the world's great navigators. Um, the uh, birthplace, in fact, Satawal itself out here in these islands. This is a picture of Mogmog Island in the north of the atoll where some of the sites are the most degraded. And here you can see the legacy of World War II. Um, this is Mogmog Island over here on the right during World War II where you can see that um, almost all of the vegetation was removed and Quonset huts were put up. We can see over here the sedimentation um, and the impact to the reefs. Here on the left is Mogmog today, where you can see it's largely revegetated. However, the impact, both ecological and social and cultural, of the World War II um, activities is huge. And this is where the Naval's Third Fleet staged um, the great battles of the Pacific Theater during World War II. So our work starts with listening, talking, and sharing. Here on the, on the left, I'm talking with some women. Below that, we're talking with one of the oldest people who live in the Outer Islands on Woliai Atoll. So really important to get multiple viewpoints from multiple different groups of people on the problem and on solutions. Here in the middle is a community meeting, mixed group. Below that, I'm talking to a reef owner who's talking to me about how he's managing the reefs, some of the problems he's having with that management. And I'm sharing with him the science that, that our team is finding and the data that, that we're finding on the reefs and pointing to some of the problems that we can see. Here on the right, the youth, of course, are one of the most critical components of working with communities. They are the future of these communities. They do have their own important impact on the reefs. And of course, they have their own views on management. So we do a lot of work with the youth and incorporate them in the work that we're doing. When communities feed back to us and talk with us about some of the issues, the primary group of issues they talk about are social issues. Um, secondly, changes in traditional ways. Thirdly, fish population and reef health, and then impacts of money on community structure, which is another social problem. So we don't see sort of reef management stuff come out here until the third category, but that's not surprising because the people of the outer islands really don't separate management from their traditional ways and from their social constructs. So their culture uh, deeply embeds management and doesn't actually pull it out as we do in the West as a sort of a separate thing, management being a separate thing. It's embedded in their cultural framework. Um, this is a really a deeply coupled social ecological system. So once we understand that, we understand that we really need to, under, to, to work at all different levels um, within the community. We took a lot of the information that we were hearing and worked with people to develop a storytelling project with funding from National Geographic. In this work, we worked with young people to interview older people 
who just talked about the stories and told stories, the kinds of stories that they would use, for example, to teach their youth about management and conservation. We then worked with those stories and pulled out the conservation and management messaging uh, from those stories and lined those up with some of the data we were collecting from the reefs. So in other words, what were some of the ways, what are some of the ways that people would, would behave in order to address some of the problems that we were finding on the reefs? This was a very powerful approach um, and the people really understood um, how their management had been changing and the fact that some of those were not necessarily for traditional reasons. We then layered knowledge, science knowledge that we were collecting from the reefs, Western science, we in, here in the upper left, collecting genetic samples from fish and corals. Um, here in the middle, benthic data to characterize the reef. We also collected data on fish biomass and fish diversity. Um, drone mapping over here on the right, as well as ROV mapping. And we're moving into using isotopes to look at trophic integrity and metabolomics to look at, at stress indicators in corals. So these are all ways to try to diagnose the reef at multiple different levels to understand what's happening. People directed us, the people of Ulithi directed us to study this coral here. This is a Montipara, most likely Montipara capitata, although we're looking at it um, to try to understand, we're doing a lot of genetics with this coral. It's a really weedy coral, and we can see here that it's growing over porites. And in fact, if you look at the background of this picture, this is all Montipara. So the people were concerned about this coral. They told us that it had started growing mostly in the 1960s, that it's been really taking over since then, and has been driving down their fish diversity and biomass. So we studied these sites carefully, and we found um, over here on the left, some of these healthier sites on the Western reefs, um, coral cover is upwards of 70% at these sites. We can see down here at the morphology pie charts, lots of branching coral, which is great fish habitat. Um, this was lined up with high fish biomass, high fish diversity. You see a little thin slice of orange. This is that Montipara. When we move closer to villages, but still exposed to the deeper water, we see much lower coral cover, somewhere around 25% here. And we also see a larger slice of this Montipara pie, this sort of orange color here, and a lower um, uh, lowering of the branching coral. Um, once we move to those degraded sites near Mogmog and in the northern part of the atoll inside the lagoon where water flow is lower, water temperatures are higher and it's shallower, we see the Montipara really finding its place and just starting to take over this large orange section here of this pie chart. And here's a picture over here on the left of these um, reefs. Interestingly, the cover goes back up to about 80%, but it's monospecific on many of these reefs. This lines up with the fish data, fish biomass much higher on these healthier reefs on the west, much lower in the lagoonal reefs. Um, fish diversity followed a very, very similar pattern. We also saw that with Montipara, uh, higher Montipara was much lower piscivore and much lower coralivore fish populations, um, showing a direct link here ecologically and the impacts of the Montipara on the ecosystem. Um, Giacomo Bernardi has done some really interesting connectivity work to try to look at genetics to see which um, islands and, and how these islands are connected using <clears throat> corals and fish. Um, in this case, it's Amphibrion chrysopterus, the orange-finned anemone fish. We found half-siblings between Patongaris up here and Yalil, and full-siblings between Philalop and Federi, showing the connectivity of these reefs. This was a really important story to tell um, with the people. Um, because it really highlights how management on one island will clearly impact another. Um, the people of Ulithi are, are, have been managing these reefs for a very long time. However, a lot of that management has broken down, hence that bar that said changes in traditional ways. And part of that was a, a lack of, of um, talking to one another. So this story really helped um, help them understand why that discussion is so important. Fisheries landings were another data set that helped explain what was happening on reefs. So this is really a story about spear guns and herbivorous fish. Um, we, the fishers themselves have developed a database of 110,000 fish. This is the largest artisanal database in the region, collecting data on reproductive status, species of fish, size of fish, where the fish is caught. Um, so the, the data here talk about spear guns and the import of a, of a non-traditional fishing method here, um, coming from Hawaii and Guam, had a huge impact because it targeted herbivorous fish. Here we can see that the largest source of catching fish is spear guns, and still, it actually is changing now, but was certainly when we started this in 2013 and 14, was spear guns. 
And the spear guns were targeting here in the middle, this uh, set of red here, these are Ulithian names, but these are all the herbivorous fish. These are the acantharids, these are the parrotfish. Um, these are the rabbit fish. So the spear guns are targeting these herbivorous fish whose role on reefs we know is so important in maintaining coral settlement, for example, substrate. So this explains a lot of the degradation we were seeing on some of the reefs where spearing is um, really intensive. Here on the left hook and line is targeting mostly snapper and emperors. And then on the right, the cast nets are really targeting one fish primarily, and that's the convict tang, Triostegus. This mirrors a larger regional problem. This is a paper by Peter Hauck of the University of Guam from 2012, where he shows how herbivorous fish, these green arrows here, are the predominant catch throughout Micronesia. The people of Ulithi then took these data, these stories, and, and all that we had been talking about and made notes on maps, notes about their own management, what they were doing, what they had been doing, what they aren't doing anymore, and notes about certain sites and what the data were showing about these sites, some sites that looked really great but showed signs of problems and other sites that were highly degraded. And they came up with their own management plans. Much of this is revitalizing traditional management, but some of it was taking into consideration fishing that was not traditional and spears really predominantly were that. So here on the right, you can see the red. They decided to close off half this island to no fishing, this is a closed area. And on the left, here, this is an open area, but no spear fishing, and in particular, no night spear fishing. So they did allow spear fishing, um, but not at night because that was targeting. Um, they came to the conclusion that that was targeting most of the male parrotfish, um, which they realized was a problem. I want us all to keep in mind that a closed area in these islands is not the same as what we might consider a closed area in the West. Um, they never close areas, for example, to community fishing after a natural disaster, such as a typhoon, and they always open a reef for special events such as high school graduations or funerals. So closed uh, does not necessarily mean closed in the way we think of closed. I'm gonna show you some data here um, from those closures. And here's Mogmog, the most degraded of those sites. And you can see how quickly the herbivorous biomass of fish has increased. In fact, on all of these sites, you can see this relatively dramatic increase actually in herbivorous fish. You'll notice a dip in 2016 this is because all of these sites were open after Typhoon Maysac, which hit in 2015. Um, so the people were able actually to get food because the supply ships weren't running at that time. We can also see, in this case, it's not herbivorous fish, it's fish biomass in general, all the way out to Satawal and Ilato atolls after one year, this is 2017 is in blue, 2018 is in red, and you can see this increase in fish biomass just one year after closures. So these are really resilient reefs and, and there's fairly dramatic changes in a short period of time. We also began to see changes in the benthos, especially on Mogmog, that most degraded site again. Unfortunately, um, we were just beginning to tell this story when COVID hit. So we haven't been back since 2019 where we started to see these changes on Mogmog. Um, more species of Acropora were showing up and Montipora was being held at bay and, and not spreading at the same rates as in some of the other sites. Herbivorous fish had rebounded and we began to see um, Oxymonocanthus longirostris, which is a coral dependent fish. We had never seen this on the reefs there and the people had told us that they hadn't seen it in many, many years. So these are exciting changes. And I wanna point out that again, there's multiple ways in, uh, of approaching these problems. We, we need to use all these different ways. Um, Co-building knowledge for management at the community level really allows for it to happen within a cultural, historical and ecological context with the greatest chance of, for sustainability and longevity. These are coupled systems. And if we don't take into account the cultural um, systems, we, we, can't really, we can't really expect to have the ecological context um, work because people rely on these reefs. And I wanna say that, that what we are very careful to consider in doing this work is for whom is this work being done? Why is the work being done? Is it needed now? Who is leading in this work? And importantly, who's answering those questions? So if we start there, we can really focus our work being for the people and if it's for the people and benefits the people, then the conservation and management goals will be met and they'll probably work for a much longer time in the future. So I wanna thank everybody here. Um, the Montipora work that we talked about is largely Michelle Paddock's work, the genetic work being done by Giacomo Bernardi and all of our funders for this project. 
Um, it's been a real journey and thank you so much for listening. <laughs>